Hello, everyone around the globe, and welcome to the seventh international work workshop on HPV Cure. We're very happy uh, that you're here. Um, unfortunately, we have to do it. Uh, we cannot do it live or in person in Toronto as we usually do, but it is an, an online meeting, um, which definitely has the benefit that more people can join it from around. Uh, there will be two different sessions, unlike other years, because of COVID. Today, we'll have a session, like a pre-ASLD session, which give, be, really gives an outline of the most important topics uh, associated with HBV cure. And then on the 2nd of December, we have um, a second session where, uh, after ASLD, the results uh, presented there will be discussed and will be presented. Today, I think we have an, an, an outstanding lineup of uh, key opinion leaders from around the globe uh, in this field. Um, <clears throat> the talks are pre-recorded around 15 minutes and there is five minutes of uh, Q&A in between the talks. And then at the end of the whole session, uh, we have another 30 minutes of a round table discussion. I'd like to thank the sponsors for uh, supporting uh, this meeting. Again, it's not the seventh time that we're doing it and we're quite Happy to uh, uh, with that. Um, Patrick, maybe if I can get the first slide. Um, so the objectives of this workshop are really to discuss on how to reach HPV functional cure and newly developed agents to develop endpoints, better biomarks of these studies and to discuss how new agents should be combined to reach the goal of functional cure. Next slide. The learning objectives are kind of similar. It's uh, and after attending, we hope that you will be able to outline the progress that has been made with HPV functional cure and agents targeting the immune system of the viral replication uh, cycle to understand how new agents should be best combined to gain functional cure and to avoid toxicity, to compare toxicity profiles and to reflect on key considerations when defining inclusion criteria for clinical evaluation of HPV cure. Strategies. Next slide. So these are the, the, the partners that uh, really endorsed uh, this meeting, and I'm very and I'm really happy with their support. It's the Toronto Center for Liver Disease, ICE HPV, HPV Forum, uh, IPAC, and ASHM. Next slide. This is the uh, corporate support, and I already thank them, but here they're visible. Really like to thank the sponsors for supporting this meeting. It's very important for us to, uh, to move on. Next slide. So there is an option, obviously, for all attendees to uh, ask questions. So to do that, you have to uh, click to open the Q and A field on the right hand side of your screen and type your questions, and then they'll the the chairs of today, uh, Anna Locke and Scott Fung, will hopefully see those. And, uh, and, and there might be many questions, so they'll, they'll pick out the most relevant and probably the best questions to be asked. Unfortunately, I, I don't think we'll have time for all of the questions. As I already mentioned, there are two sessions. One is today uh, from 10 a.m. Eastern time here on the East Coast of uh, North America. And then the, the, se the second session, which is I think also very interesting is on the 2nd of December. Next slide. So now I think I move over to, uh, to the session chairs that I would like to uh, uh, introduce. Um, I don't know if there's more slides coming. I can do that later as well. Can I have the next slide, if you're sure? Anyway, okay, so the, the, session, the, the session chairs, yeah, maybe go back. So that, that's for, for Anna and, and Scott to do, sorry about that. So the session chair don't need a lot of introductions. It's actually a, a mentor and a mentee, which is quite interesting and nice. And Anna Locke is, is quite well known. She is uh, <clears throat> grew up in Hong Kong, as part of the Hong Kong Medical School, did her training of hepatology in London under Dame Sheila Sherlock in the Royal Free, then moved back and got on faculty in Hong Kong. Uh, but then a couple of decades ago, moved over to, in 1995 to be precise, moved over to the University of Michigan, where she has been from that time on in Ann Arbor. Uh, she's, she's really one of the most uh, important key opinion leaders in this field of hepatitis B. 
particularly in natural history and treatment, hepatitis B and C. She's published more than 500 papers, uh, a, a lot of different guidelines for ASOB and for the World Health Organization. And we're very happy to have you here. Uh, and uh, although it is uh, electronically, unfortunately, uh, and then um, the other chair is from Toronto, um, actually trained by Anna is Scott Fung, who is um, an associate professor here at the University of uh, Toronto and a hepatologist at the University Health Network, involved in a lot of studies on new treatment of hepatitis B. He's the director uh, of gastroenterology education uh, within uh, University Health Network and uh, participates in a lot of studies and co-directs the hepatology fellowship. So uh, Anna and Scott, it's uh, up to you. Take it away. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Hari um, and um, Adam for organizing this um, very important um, uh, workshop. Um, and I have the pleasure of um, co-moderating with um, Scott. Um, and our first speaker, we have a great lineup of um, speakers. Um, our first speaker, um, next slide, uh, is um, Professor Fabian Sulim, uh, who is extremely well known in this um, field. Um, Dr. Salim um, grew up in France and uh, went to the Lyon Medical School. Uh, he did uh, further training at Fox Chase um, in Philadelphia, uh, has been professor of medicine at Lyon University and head of the hepatology program there. Um, he's published many, many um, important um, articles on hepatitis B. Um, he's um, currently involved in um, European Community Funded um, Research Network of Excellence, um, the NRS um, HPV Cure Program, uh, as well as the um, ICE HPV um, program. Um, and uh, we look forward to um, hearing him talk about the potential of um, new treatments um, for hepatitis um, B. Uh, and um, um, so, um, Dr. Sulin, um, so I think we're going to um, play his um, recorded talk. So first of all, I would like to, to thank Harry Hansen and Adam Gehring for uh, the invitation to give this talk on the potential of new combinations to achieve functional cure for chronic hepatitis B. Here you see my disclosures. Um, as you uh, all know, there are uh, major barriers to functional cure of HBV infection, which mainly rely on the fact that the uh, viral genome persists as a form of covalently closed circular DNA or CCC DNA, which has a long half-life in the uh, nucleus of infected cells and is not affected by nucleoside analogs and interferon. The second very important point is that uh, in chronically infected patients, uh, we observe defective immune responses, mainly of HBV-specific CD8-positive uh, cells and HBV-specific B cells. There is also a, a weak innate uh, immune response in those patients. So the, the current concept is that we would need to have a combination uh, of direct acting antivirals and immune modulators to uh, combat HBV and increase the rate of functional cure. Uh, we are very fortunate now that we are in, in a very exciting time of HBV research because we have drugs uh, that have uh, entered uh, clinical trial development and we are not talking about only preclinical data, we are talking about clinical uh, trial results. So we have emerging uh, treatment targets that either target uh, the, directly the viral replication uh, and we can have concepts which are uh, corrective approaches which target the pool of CCC DNA in, in the, the liver of infected uh, patients uh, that may cure the, the uh, infected hepatocytes. There are other targets controlling the pre and post CCC DNA steps of the viral life cycle, including entry uh, inhibition, targeting viral RNAs, capsid assembly modulators, and inhibitors of HBS and gen release. The uh, second aspect, um, as I mentioned before, is that we have uh, strategies to boost the uh, immune responses that may rely on the uh, uh, stimulation of innate immunity uh, that may express viral antiviral cytokines that may cure infected hepatocytes, but also uh, strategies to um, uh, stimulate adaptive immunity um, that may lead to specific hepatocyte killing 
viral neutralization, but also antiviral cytokine responses. Uh, so we, we will see how we can combine all these different approaches to, to increase the, the uh, functional cure rate in, in our patients. Besides this drug discovery efforts, there are also efforts to discover uh, novel biomarkers uh, that will be very important for the evaluation of, of the new drugs in clinical trials. Uh, so beside the uh, classic viral load assays, we have quantitative HBS antigen, which is really the, the major clinical uh, endpoint because it is associated with a strong clinical uh, outcome. The caveat with HBS antigen is that it is expressed both from uh, CCC DNA and integrated bowel sequences. So there are uh, other novel biomarkers that are uh, being evaluated, uh, which are circulating uh, viral RNA and mainly pregenomic RNA and HBC-related antigen, uh, which are um, thought to be uh, currently more relevant um, uh, for the evaluation of the transcriptional activity of the CCC DNA pool in the liver. So these biomarkers are important not only to assess target engagement of the new drugs in, in the clinic, but also to uh, uh, predict the endpoint of HBS loss. So this will be very important for the evaluation of, of the combination trial. So as I said, I mean, these different drugs that, are, uh, that have been developed in, uh, recently uh, have now entered clinical trials and we have very exciting results um, on the first uh, combination trials. Uh, and as you can see, we have these drugs that belong to different classes. Uh, uh, several drugs inhibit viral replication. Uh, some inhib inhibit uh, viral antigen expression. Uh, and regarding uh, immune stimulation, we have drugs that uh, aim at invigorating immune responses and approaches such as therapeutic vaccine that aim at stimulating HBV-specific B and T cells. So you see that we have uh, quite a lot of drugs and strategies that may be combined uh, to increase the rate of functional cure. So we'll uh, show you some example uh, of, of recent clinical trials. Uh, so here uh, as a first example is whether we can combine direct acting antiviral to uh, increase viral suppression and maybe obtain uh, a functional cure uh, just with, with uh, antivirals. Um, so we, there are um, uh, attempts to using nucleoside analogs and capsid assembly uh, modulators that have been recently published. So there is a, quite a lot of interest and excitement with the uh, development of capsid assembly modulators that you have seen in, in, in the last uh, couple of years uh, with drugs that show uh, in phase 1b a very nice decline in HBV DNA uh, levels um, by approximately two to four logs uh, in these trials. And uh, this was accompanied by a decline also in pregenomic RNA in serum. But there was no effect on the HBS antigen in, in this very uh, short-term trial. Now there is some uh, uh, longer experience uh, with longer administration uh, of capsid assembly modulators in combination with nucleoside analog. And you see one of the examples uh, of this combination uh, therapies that have been uh, presented at the latest ESOL meeting. And you see that with Vebicorvir, after 72 weeks of administration, you see a very strong decline of HBV DNA when it's administered in combination with Antecavir uh, by approximately seven log, which is really impressive. And it is accompanied by also a decline in pregenomic RNA in serum, which is consistent with the mode of action uh, of, uh, of the Bicovia uh, uh, capsid assembly modulator. When you look at the effect of this combination of Antecavir and Bicovia on the uh, biomarkers that I just alluded to, you see a, a decline in pregenomic RNA in serum of, of HBC-related antigen as well as HBS antigen uh, in, in some patients. So you, we are in a situation where we can really ask the question whether a combination of new plus a capsid assembly modulator uh, may be sufficient to uh, achieve a functional cure with longer term administration, 
or whether at some point when uh, all the biomarkers would be uh, undetectable in serum, we could stop treatment and see whether we could maintain viral suppression or even achieve uh, a functional cure after treatment withdrawal. Now moving to other type of uh, combination uh, of direct acting antivirals, we have seen results of a combination of nucleoside analogs and approaches to uh, decrease ant antigen expression, mainly with siRNA and antisense oligonucleotides. Here you see um, the results of clinical trial combining uh, nucleoside analog and uh, siRNA from uh, from JNJ, uh, which was earlier uh, earlier on developed by uh, Arrowhead, and you see that in that phase two study presented uh, uh, at Easel. Um, uh, patients, uh, 40 patients on nukes received three administration of the SI uh, RNA, uh, which led to a decrease of HBS antigen in the vast majority uh, of patients. More than one log decline was observed. And it was interesting to see that 15 out of 38 patients, so 40% of patients, were uh, responder throughout the study and maintain the uh, decline of HBS antigens through uh, the whole study at, uh, until day three, 392, which uh, is really interesting uh, and will pave the way for future uh, evaluation uh, um, uh, in a very near future. Another approach is um, to uh, combine a nuke with an antisense oligonucleotide. Uh, and this was presented again at EASEL. Uh, this was developed by uh, GSK. And you see that in that study, there were patients who were nucleoside analog naive or patients who were already virally suppressed and received the antisense oligonucleotide. Uh, what is interesting is that 80% of the patients have seen an HBS antigen decline by more than uh, one log. Uh, which is very impressive in, in such uh, at such stage of clinical development, and four patients, those with an asterisk, uh, had an HBS loss at day 29, and two of them remain undetectable at the end of the study. What was interesting to see is that H the um, magnitude of HBS antigen uh, decline was higher in patients with. ALT elevation, and we'll have to see whether this was due to some kind of immune restoration. Another type of uh, combination of direct acting antiviral is a triple combination, so a nuke, a capsid assembly immunator, uh, modulator, and an siRNA. And this was presented uh, last year at the SLD by JNJ and NFUN. Uh, we show that this first proof of concept study uh, in patients receiving this triple uh, combination showed a robust reduction in HBS antigen, HBV DNA, and HBV RNA. So all patients achieve a more than one log uh, decline in HBS antigen, and this decline was uh, similar uh, in HB positive or negative patients. So this is really a, a first study with this type of triple combination uh, of direct acting antiviral and then we will see whether uh, this will be sufficient to cure infected patients or whether we will need uh, something else, so uh, an approach uh, uh, combining uh, an immune modulatory uh, strategy. So we come here to combination uh, trials having a, a, an antiviral uh, with a strategy boosting innate uh, in immunity. Uh, so the first attempt was uh, with the use of an entry inhibitor, uh, Mircludex, together with interferon uh, in chronic hepatitis delta. So we showed interesting results on HDV RNA, but here looking at the effect on HBS antigen, what was remarkable is that 40% um, of patients had more than one log decline uh, of HBS when they received a 2 mg uh, Mircludex plus pegylated interferon. So we'll have to keep this in mind for patients who are mono-infected uh, uh, with HPV for future clinical trials. Uh, another combination trial was uh, using 
uh, tenofovir with an HBS antigen release uh, inhibitor, a nucleic acid polymer, with interferon, and it was uh, recently published in gastroenterology. This approach developed by Replico showed that 35% of patients had a functional cure uh, 48 weeks uh, after treatment cessation, which is something that is very uh, uh, remarkable and promising, so we'll have to see how it holds on the long term. Another approach with uh, antiviral and, and innate immunity uh, boosting is a combination of a nuke with a TLR8 agonist, uh, which, which was shown uh, recently in a phase two study at EASL, showing uh, a very good safety profile uh, and a modest decline in HBS antigen levels. So we'll have to see whether in the future this could be a backbone for a combination with uh, other uh, direct acting antivirals or immune modulators to increase the rate of HBS antigen decline. Lastly, the combination of a therapeutic vaccine to stimulate HBV specific T cells or B cells uh, has been evaluated in combination with NUC, and we know that it was a little bit disappointing. So the, the uh, investigators went on to a triple combination in association with a checkpoint inhibitor, like an anti-PD-1, such as nivolumab. And you see here the results that were published recently by Ed Gain and Gilead, showing that with a, a combination of single dose of nivolumab and a T-cell vaccine, um, you can see uh, some decline of HBS antigen uh, level in that combination. And in that trial, what was interesting is that a single patient lost HBS antigen, but he was in, in the uh, arm receiving the nuke plus nivolumab, but not the uh, therapeutic vaccine. So we'll have to, to learn from these uh, studies and see how we can move forward uh, in terms of clinical development for this type of triple therapy. Uh, another approach, which has not yet been studied uh, to my knowledge in patients, is the antigenic uh, reduction with an siRNA and a therapeutic vaccine. This has been studied in a preclinical model, uh, so in transgenic mice which were treated with siRNA and received a prime boost uh, vaccine. And in that strategy where HBS antigen level were uh, suppressed by the siRNA, the vaccination uh, was very effective and HBS loss and HBS zero conversion uh, was observed. So now we have all the tools to evaluate uh, this type of approach now in clinical trials as siRNA and therapeutic vaccines are available. Now when we have uh, seen all these different approaches, what can we do um, in terms of clinical development? We can uh, combine replication inhibitors, uh, antigen expression inhibition, uh, and this may be sufficient eventually to, to cure the infection, or we may be in a situation where we, we need to combine with strategies to invigorate immune responses or even stimulate these, uh, these responses. So we'll have to see how we can combine this in clinical trials. And there are several ways to uh, address that issues, and we have learned a lot from the oncology field, which use uh, platform trials where um, we can use a single infrastructure with different strategies that are evaluated over time um, with a common control arm to aid in efficiency. However, we should not forget exploratory trials with small group of patients belonging to different phases of the disease to investigate different treatment regimens that may be uh, relevant uh, to one or the other phase of the disease. So these different types of strategies need to be explored in the future. So in conclusion, I hope I showed you that there are some promise from the early phase clinical trials combining different uh, approaches that showed HPS decline. We will need larger groups of patients and longer follow-up to assess the rate of functional cure and its sustainability. Um, and we'll have also the need to validate biomarkers to predict functional cure to speed up clinical development and see whether these biomarkers can help us in response-guided treatment cessation. Uh, as I said, uh, disease and patient heterogeneity will need to be considered in the development path of these combination uh, studies. Uh, as well as a need for better assessment of responses on the CCC DNA reservoir and the immune restoration. 
Uh, we should also support ongoing drug discovery effort to feed the drug pipeline that will be needed to have uh, improved um, combination therapies. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm ready to take questions. Fabian, for a very uh, excellent overview of a complicated uh, topic. Uh, perhaps I can ask just a, a quick question. Uh, Fabian, what do you think, which combination uh, would be the most uh, uh, favorable or promising in terms of leading to, I think, an off-treatment response? Do we need a triple combination with siRNA, or do you think we can get by with uh, uh, a nuke and a CPAM for the best uh, off-treatment response? Uh, well, if we <laughs> thank you for the, the question, uh, Scott. It's a very complicated uh, question, actually. But uh, if we go uh, uh, straight, uh, the um, with the current knowledge that we have, uh, we we we've seen from recent recent results that uh, uh, a combination of direct antivirals may be extremely uh, difficult to to achieve this functional cure. Um, so in, in today, in in my view, um, the the ideal situation would be. Uh, uh, an inhibition of our replication, um, combining with um, um, inhibition of um, antigen expression. So um, let's say a, a, a CAM or a new plus an siRNA, uh, and then coming with an Im immune stimulation. Uh, this is the what would be, in, in my view, the uh, ideal clinical trial if we, if we can do it. Might be a combination in different uh, in different phases or different uh, start points and uh, starting times and and, and uh, durations. Very interesting. Great. So uh, can we go on to the uh, next talk now? In the interest of time. And so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Henry Chan, who really needs uh, no introduction. Professor Chan is a clinical honorary professor uh, of Faculty of Medicine at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, Professor Chan has been a key investigator in over 30 international trials of uh, antiviral treatment for chronic hepatitis B and hepatitis C, and is really a global uh, leader and key opinion leader in the studies of uh, PEG uh, interferon alpha, PEG lambda, uh, tobivudine, uh, tenofovir, as well as a TAF for the treatment of chronic hepatitis B. Henry has published over uh, a stunning 450 papers in peer-reviewed journals and was uh, recently awarded as the highly cited researcher for producing the top 10, the top 1%, uh, excuse me, of cited papers uh, in the uh, web of uh, science. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Henry and to ask him to speak to us today about uh, the inclusion of uh, uh, immune tolerant and low viral load patients in clinical trials. Henry? Today, I'm going to address a very controversial topic to you, the rationale for including immune tolerant and low viral load patients in new drug trials. Nowadays, these groups of patients usually considered not for treatment. These are my disclosures. Immune tolerance phase is the characteristic first phase in patients who acquire HPV infection at infancy is characterized by high HPV DNA level, positive E engine, normal ALT, and minimal histologic damage. So all guidelines recommend that we should observe these patients and not to start treatment. The latest ASLD guideline in, tw in 2018 actually clearly stated that there were no studies demonstrating antiviral is beneficial in reducing rates of liver cancer cirrhosis, and liver-related deaths in patients with immune tolerance chronic hepatitis B. However, there are potential harms, including cost, antiviral drug side effects, and development of drug resistance, particularly in using earlier antiviral drugs, and this might outweigh the benefits. Therefore, ASLD recommends against antiviral therapy for adults with immune tolerant chronic hepatitis B. Recent years, there are increasing arguments towards treating patients in immune tolerance phase. First, 
We believe that high viral load is associated with high risk of liver cancer. Therefore, if you suppress HPV DNA, there is a chance that we can reduce the risk of liver cancer. There are also arguments towards earlier treatment of chronic hepatitis B because it might reduce HPV DNA integration into the host chromosome and it might also reduce the risk of liver cancer. In angle of public health, these patients have very high viral load. Treating these patients may reduce the rates of both horizontal and vertical transmission. And lastly, to define who has immunotolerance, who has not, may be a difficult task in some patients. And if you treat all patients, it may simplify treatment strategy to drive HPV elimination goal. However, treatment is not easy for these patients, and we nowadays do not have the right drug. So I'm showing you one of the pivotal study of treating immunotolerant patients, that is D positive patient with high HPV DNA, normal AOT, and in this study, patients were randomized to receive either tenofovir, disoproxyfumarate, uh, TDF, monotherapy, or TDF plus anthracytamine, FTC, as a combination therapy for four years. Response was defined as DNA less than 69 at the end of four years. If you look at the primary outcome measure, that is HPV DNA below 69, only 50% of patients on TDF monotherapy and 76% on combo therapy could achieve this endpoint. So most patients uh, uh, can have DNA suppressed, but still a significant proportion have DNA detectable. The more difficult endpoint to achieve is HPE annual serial conversion. Almost 0% of patients could achieve this. In other words, when we stop therapy, almost all patients relapse. So TDF and even combination of TDF with FTC is not good enough to treat immunotolerant patients. There are uh, studies trying to use combo therapy, and I'm showing you one study combining antecovia with PET interferon combination in adults. So again, these patients have high viral load, AOT less than 1.5 times absolute normal. Among 20 of them, none of them could achieve as loss. 4% achieved ECU conversion at the end of treatment and also one year after stopping treatment, and none of them could have DNA less than 1,000 one year after stopping treatment. So again, combination therapy may not be good for adults. Similar studies have been reported in children. People believe that treating early may have a high success rate, but unfortunately for immunotolerant patients, it may not be the case. So 60 patients in this study, again combining antecnophia with PEC interferon therapy. At one year after stopping treatment, only 3% achieved S loss, and the same patient, of course, had E2 conversion and undetectable HPV DNA, but all other patients had HPV DNA more than 1,000 one year after stopping treatment. So again, we do not have the right drug to treat this patient, and therefore these patients should be put in a clinical trial if we want to treat them. The second group of patients are patients with low viral load and we call low replicative effects. So this is the group of patients characterized by negative e-antigen, positive e-antibody, low HPV DNA, and low AOT and normal AOT level, and most guidelines recommend observation. This we sometimes call inactive carriers is primarily defined by HPV DNA level. And HPV DNA should be less than 2,000 IU per mil, as you can see from all the guidelines. And most of these patients should have normal AOT level repeatedly for a few times. The reason why HPV DNA is used as the key parameter to define inactive carrier is because of this very important study from Taiwan, the review HPV study. So they included more than 3,600 hepatitis B patients followed for more than 11 years. Most of these patients have negative e antigen, normal AOT, and most of them did not have liver cirrhosis. And in this study, they found that if HPV DNA 
is lower than four log uh, copies per mil. That is about 2,000 IU in the natural units per mil. They have a low risk of XCC and a low risk of cirrhosis. Another Taiwanese study called the Radicate B study showing a very, very similar finding that is HPDA less than 2,000 IU per mil have a low risk of XCC. Further reduction of viral load will not reduce the risk of cancer. However, patients still can be classified into a higher XCC risk group and a lower XCC risk group among, the, among patients with DNA less than 2000 by HPSAG level. For those patients with HPSAG less than 1000, DNA less than 2000, they have a much lower risk than the patient with the same DNA level but higher SAG level, indicating the importance of HPSAG to, uh, to differentiate cancer risk. Going back to the review study, in another paper reporting a separate analysis of a review study, we can see that the lowest XCC risk was actually in patients with undetectable HPV DNA and S loss. So S loss is a very important endpoint in these patients. So remember, these are untreated patients, these are natural, spontaneous S loss patients and the lifetime risk is only 4% for liver cancer. If a patient has undetectable DNA, but no S loss, that is positive HPSAG, the lifetime risk is about 1.5% uh, or 5 times higher. For yin negative patient, positive DNA, no S loss, the lifetime cancer risk can be more than threefold higher than those with S loss. So S loss should be the ultimate goal of patients, even they are inactive carriers. There are a few studies trying to use PEC interferon to treat these inactive carriers and see how many of them can achieve S loss. However, the results vary from 3% to 94%. Although in a control group, none of the patients in the 4K series could achieve S loss. So it is very difficult to say whether PEG interferon is a good enough treatment for inactive carriers. When we look deeper into the design of these studies, most of these studies are from China, one study is from the Netherlands, and these are, most of them are prospective cohorts, open label studies, and they use PEG interferon for at least 48 weeks. The Netherlands study use it up uh, used with a defofi or tenofovir combination, but achieve the lowest S loss rate. And one Chinese study uh, used technifier up to 96 weeks. The key difference among these studies were the HPV DNA and the HPSH level of patients on recruitment. That is at the time we start technifier. For those studies who Use PEC to start PEC interferon among patients with lower DNA, that is less than 100 and less than 200 IU per mil, and lower HPSAG level, that is less than 100 and even lower than 20 IU per mil, the success rate is much, much higher from 60 to 94%. On the other hand, if you treat patients with high viral load, the response rate is much worse. So, based on all these data, where are we now today? For immunotolerant patient, we do have some rationales to treat, but most of these rationales are still arguments. We don't have hard, solid data suggesting that not treating these patients will increase the risk of liver cancer. So there is insufficient evidence to recommend treatment nowadays. And we know that what we have right now, that is PEC and Ephiron and NA, even when combining them, are not good enough. Therefore, these patients should be put into clinical trials. For the patient with low viral load, they can have better prognosis after S0 clearance, but overall, they are a low risk group to observe. So there's no hurry to treat these patients, but it's good to push them one step further to lose surface antigen, and you know that they can have an even lower cancer risk. PEC interferon has some success, particularly in patients with low HPV DNA and low HPSAG. However, because 
Pain interference has its side effect. It requires injection. It is good to have new drugs to treat these patients, and therefore they should also be put into clinical trials. So for the direction of new drug trials in these two groups of patients, for immunotolerant patients, we should look for an effective drug regimen. We know that probably it is not a single drug. It's probably a combination of drugs. We always hope for ST recurrence. It's a functional cure. It's almost a universal endpoint for all treatment trials. But however, because this is a very hard to treat group, I think yeast cell conversion can be an acceptable endpoint during the process of drug development. For patients of low viral load, these are low risk group. We should look for a safe and effective drug regimen. So safety is important because even if you don't treat, they are not having a very high risk of liver cancer and preferably the treatment is of shorter duration. From the lessons of PEC interferon, we learned that patient selection is a concern. So we select patients with lower SAG level, lower viral low, probably we can have a high rate of success. And of course, SU conversion should be the endpoint for this group of patients in new clinical trials. With that, thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you so much, um, Henry. Um, this is a great talk on a very controversial topic. Um, as you indicate, um, with the current treatment, um, we have not had much success in the immune tolerant patients and rightfully so you recommend that they go into clinical trials. Um, but what do you think would be the best combination that has a chance to work for these patients? Well, I think this is a hard question, Anna. Uh, frankly speaking, I don't like suppressing the virus forever for these patients because usually they're younger. So I guess in some immune moderation is necessary. If we learn from the data of tenofovir, just by pushing the DNA down may not be good enough to stimulate the host immune clearance because after four years of viral suppression, these patients are still E-positive and we still do not see any evidence of immune stimulation. So probably some extrinsic immune moderation is necessary together with some viral suppression. And this viral suppression may not be just the DNA, maybe also other open reading frames like maybe an RNA interference that suppresses all sorts of viral proteins, but definitely we need to try before we can, before we can tell. Yeah, so far, we haven't had a lot of them success with immune um, therapy, even in the immune active patients. Um, so the strategy of um, what immune modulatory therapy is gonna work um, in the more tolerant patient uh, is gonna be a difficult um, problem that um, would need some work. Yeah, certainly. Well, with that, um, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Chen for this um, great talk, and we'll move on to our next talk. Um, this will be given by um, Dr. Um, Professor Pietro Lampertico, who is very well known in this um, field. Um, professor Lampertico um, is a full professor as well as the director of um, gastroenterology and hepatology uh, at the Milan University. And over the last um, 20, 30 years, he's published um, a lot um, on um, treatment of hepatitis B, uh, as well as the natural history. Um, most of his work is on uh, long-term outcomes, uh, in particular in the energy negative um, patients. Uh, and we look forward to, um, to hearing his um, talk. Um, welcome, Professor Lampertico. So hello to everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to this very important meeting. My topic today will be how to interpret flares in HB trials with novel agents. These are my disclosures. I will briefly cover the different definitions of LT flares, briefly LT flares during the natural history and standard HPV treatments. Most of my presentation will cover the issue of LT flares in HPV trials with new antivirals, and then I will sum up all the data. So first of all, let's start with the definition. So on the left side, you see some of the most recent definition from Dr. Kenny from US, uh, and he provided a very clear, very simple definition. LT flare is defined when LT go above five times the upper limit of normal. 
uh, sometimes even above 10 times the epilimidal normal. On the right hand side, you see another very recent paper from the HPV forum group where they classify the flares into four different grades from minimal to max to severe. And this is again associated to for the moderate to severe, uh, about five times the upper limit or normal. Uh, you know, hepatitis B is a very dynamic disease. So we have been managed flares uh, in the natural history for the last 30 to 40 years, really, both for the antigen positive and negative patients. In this recent uh, uh, NICE paper, flares have been divided into good flares and bad flares. Uh, on the right hand side, you'll be two examples of what we call good flares, uh, an ALT flares in the antigen positive chronic hepatitis leading to E antigen seroconversion, and in the lower panel, an ALT flare and the antigen negative patients uh, leading to uh, full um, functional cure, uh, which means S antigen loss. So these are good flares. Uh, of course, bad flares are those flares. Uh, not leading to any clinical significant outcome. Please also remember the flares have been described in the uh, standard antiviral therapies, including oral therapy and PEG interferon, mainly with PEG interferon and mainly in the antigen positive population. There are other definitions of flares, and this is another uh, very recent publication. According to this publication, flares can be uh, defined during therapy, antiviral flares, virus-induced flares, and, and drug-induced flares. And I have to tell you sometimes, in my opinion, it's not so easy to differentiate flares in all different subtypes. And even more recently, there is another very important publication. Actually, this is a review article from Professor Liao uh, suggesting two new definitions. A host dominating flare means an uh, ALT flare followed by a very good, not only biochemical, but also serological and virological response. Whether a virus dominating flare is a flare which is followed by maybe biochemical uh, improvement, but not serological improvement. And these two flares are really, you know, supported by a difference in the immunological response. Uh, the effective immuno of flares or hosta or good flares are related to an enhanced TH1 response, whether the bad flares or virus dominated flares are characterized by uh, the absence of enhanced TH1 response. Again, this is another definition, uh, another you know, a way we can call the flare. This has been specifically designed after cessation of new therapy, just to make a point that sometimes kind of complicated with all these new definitions. Let's move to the second part of my presentation. So what's about the flares uh, in patients treated with new antivirals? So the first strategy could be uh, to intensify viral suppression. And uh, uh, this has been achieved by uh, companies uh, developing uh, CAM or capsid assembly inhibitors or core inhibitors. This is a safety summary of the most recent data presented at ESL 2020 uh, by this drug, uh, which is assembly CAM in three different studies, left side the antigen positive population, on the right hand side the antigen negative population, and really, there were only three patients only who developed a significant LT flares. One the antigen negative, this was associated to exercise. Two other patients among the antigen positive, one associated with a good flare, another probably to alcohol abuse. So overall, there is no really any major problem with ALT flares during therapy with CAM. And this was really expected given the mechanism of CAM. However, you know, according to this uh, uh, company and this study design, they are going to stop therapy in many of the patients if they achieve a specific endpoint in terms of serology and virological suppression. So you might not see flares during therapy, but you might see flares of therapy in these drugs. And there is a very recent press release from Assembly you know, suggesting that actually more than 95% of these patients of therapy had a virological relapse 
and they did not describe flares, but I would suspect that many of these patients really end up with a flare that led to restart antiviral therapy. So no flares during therapy, but yes, probably flares of therapy. Another company which is working very hard on the uh, uh, CAM is j and And again, this is a summary slide on the safety of this drug being administered in a phase 2A in a large number of patients for 24 weeks. Again, there is no evidence of any major problem with flares, even in the uh, high dose of j and j uh, 3679 in combination with oral therapy. Very few patients had a flare. And again, we are not expecting any major flare uh, in this with this antiviral strategy. The second mechanism of action, which has been uh, followed by, by some uh, drugs and some uh, companies, is to stop antigen production or release. Well, if you stop antigen production by siRNA, for example, these are the data again from J and J, uh, you provide three injections, and with one injection, you achieve approximately you know, one log reduction of S antigen. Uh, three injection leads to approximately two log reduction. The right hand side, you see the side effects. You the first 57 days, uh, actually, you know, you don't see any basically problem with ALT flares. And there is a recent update that is uh, looking at the flare or at the safety from day 58 to day 392. Again, there was only one single patient. He did not meet the criteria for a flare. PKLT was quite very limited. So again, uh, with this sort of technology, with this sort of compound, there is no evidence of flares, ALT flares during therapy or off treatment. Please remember, all these patients were on long-term oral therapy. This is not really off therapy uh, with all drugs. However, in terms of a similar but different mechanism of action, uh, and I mean anti-sense oligo from GXK, these data have been presented very recently again at ESL meeting, and this probably is one of the most important slides of my presentation. So we are still targeting S antigen, all the RNAs leading to S antigen decline with a different mechanism of action compared to siRNA. In this study, there was a clear relationship between max LT levels and S antigen reduction with some of the patients with very high LT levels. In blue, blue dots means naive patients. You know, this orange dot means nuke suppressed patients. Let's start with nuke suppressed. In the study, there were four nuke suppressed. Three of the few had the significant flares. You see that these three drugs are very, very important because these patients were all nuke suppressed. They received six injections with the ASO GSK A36, and they had a very profound S antigen decline. Uh, this was sort of the three cases. Very profound means more than three lots. So please remember, very profound S antigen decline in a very short period of time. And this was followed, and this is something new, followed by an ALT flare, which was associated with negative S in two cases and very low S antigen in another case. However, this flare uh, did not lead to sustained S antigen uh, response because two patients and an antigen rebound and one also rebound a dollar less. So this is a very unique pattern. Please remember this ALT flare after S antigen became negative. In, among the antigen uh, positive or negative patients but naive to therapy, there, was, there were two patients, again, right inside the lower panel with a significant grade four ALT flare. This is one case. Again, this is a single case, GSK as a monotherapy, major percentage decline, more than three lots, major and very fast DNA decline, followed by the significant ALT flare together with S antigen negativity. But unfortunately, new treatment by protocol was restarted in all patients at week 29. So it's unclear whether this could have been even higher uh, but again, a very significant effect, again, after S antigen was negative. 
Another mechanism is immunomodulation. There is no major any problem with ALT increase by these drugs, but most of the drugs were really not really effective. I just remind you that for one drug, SB920, this has been a major problem with liver toxicity recently at the beginning of this year, and the, the clinical development has been stopped. For the GSK9688, uh, most recent data being presented at ESL, no evidence of ALT flares for the 924-week uh, data. However, there is a very interesting study. One single patient achieved this antigen load by using nevolumab as the anti-PD-1 blockade in this recent study by Ed Gale. And very, very important because the pattern is again different. He got one single injection, no changes of ALT or antigen within the first few weeks. Then an ALT flare followed. This time is followed by an S antigen decline with a mechanism which is completely different from the ASO mechanism which I showed you before, and this is probably because of the different mechanism of action of nivoluma. And then what's about ALT flares in strategies targeting at the same time viral inhibition, viral uh, uh, DNA, uh, RNA inhibition, and immunomodulation. The only example I'm aware of is this study recently published on gastroenterology, 48 weeks of REP plus TDF plus PEG, uh, red curves mean triple therapy, the blue curves are double therapy, PEG plus new without RAP, uh, and uh, without NAP basically. And again, very striking S antigen decline and anti-S production with triple therapy associated with very significant flares. Here we are looking at very significant flares in 95% of the patients. You know, basically at the same time, apparently, you have, you know, a flare, you also have a S antigen decline. And these were associated with a very good, uh, you know, of virological controls long term and functional control long term. But very recently, there's been a, a very nice analysis trying to correlate flares with S antigen loss. So my understanding is that if you separate patients in three different categories according to the therapeutic outcomes, there are really no differences in terms of LT levels at baseline, no differences in terms of maximum LT during therapy, and no difference at the end of therapy. And also there were no difference in terms of ALT, AUC, and S antigen log decline as long as the S antigen decline was before three logs, you see here, no correlation. But actually there was some correlation uh, in patients who achieve a more than three log decline between S antigen decline and ALT. And probably the most important information on the right hand side, you know, if you consider S antigen decline at the ALT peak, you see the patients who achieve functional cure at a much lower S antigen levels at the ALT peak compared to the other patients. And in the lower part, you see uh, a more analysis in a larger number of patients, including the Delta patients. Again, the S antigen levels at the peak may anticipate, may predict functional cure, uh, suggesting again, another possible mechanism of these flares in these patients uh, undergoing triple therapy compared to other patients and going undergoing dual therapy or monotherapy. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen and dear colleagues, I think the ALT flares with new antivirals is a kind of complicated topic, not only for the different definitions, but because antivirals have different mechanisms of action, they are targeting different uh, you know, uh, steps of viral replication. They target replication, they target S antigen production, and they have different study designs uh, on therapy, during therapy, and the duration of the study is of course different. This makes the interpretation of flares quite complicated. For CAM and for siRNA, I was not able to find any specific any significant ALT flare. For ASO, indeed, uh, I think uh, there were significant ALT flares 
but these flares occurred after S antigen decline. And when S antigen became negative, this was true for both naive as well as the new treated patients. And one possible explanation could be very fast and very profound S antigen decline. Maybe this could be the reason of this significant ALT flares. For immunomodulators, no evidence of flares for the total receptor A agonist, and very too few data, I would say, for nivolumab. For the triple combination NAP plus TDF plus PEG, severe flares in the vast majority of the, of the patient, but during triple therapy, and these flares were associated with virological control as antigen loss, and apparently the levels of as antigen levels at the flare are really predictive of the therapeutic outcomes. So two messages from clinicians to pharma. Please provide individual graph for patients uh, with flares. That's very relevant uh, to try to understand the kinetics and the mechanism of action. Please be full transparent. And again, from clinician to pharma, we do not like flares. Unless they are modest, transient, and associated with significant and sustained S antigen loss rate. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Pietro, for an outstanding talk on, again, a very uh, complicated uh, topic. Perhaps I can ask just a, a very uh, quick question. But in terms of the, those patients, as you alluded to earlier, uh, Pietro, it's often very difficult to, to know if a patient is undergoing a good flare or an immune flare or a, a bad flare. Uh, and so uh, presumably in those E antigen negative patients uh, whom you've stopped therapy, uh, how long do you wait to decide whether you're going to retreat and at, at what level of DNA or ALT would you suggest? Well, Scott, thank you very much. This is a very you know, difficult question, of course. Uh, so we tend to wait. We know that we will see a rebound of a rim in everybody stopping a uh, nuke, uh, and some, many will have ALT increase. So the idea, the strategy is that we do not do a rescue uh, the first DNA increase, and we do not do a rescue after the first ALT increase. So we leave at least one flare, let's say. Uh, you know, this is easy to say, but this is very much complicated in, in real life. It's not so easy, it's not so easy to, to predict the outcome, uh, but this is the strategy we are following. You showed in the assembly data, uh, I think as all those patients stopped uh, therapy, uh, you're right, they all had a very quick uh, virologic relapse uh, after the treatment was stopped, particularly in the E positive patients. But it will be interesting to see clinically what happened to those patients and the course of their ALT flares will, be, I think, be very, very enlightening. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Pietro. You're welcome. I think we shall move on now to our uh, next uh, speaker, who again needs uh, no introduction. Uh, Professor Jordan uh, Feld uh, completed his uh, medical school and residency training uh, in internal medicine and GI at the University of Toronto. Uh, he then went on to clinical uh, research in hepatology at the liver disease uh, branch of uh, NIH. Uh, he then uh, received his master's of public health focusing on infectious diseases at uh, Johns Hopkins University and he continues to maintain a strong interest in uh, international health. Uh, currently, uh, Professor Feld is appointed as our clinician scientist at the University of Toronto and Toronto Center of Liver, for Liver Disease and the McLaughlin uh, Rotman Center for uh, Global Health. And so with that, I'm gonna ask uh, Jordan to uh, teach us all about the toxicity associated with new and established hepatitis B therapies. Welcome, Jordan. Great. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you to the organizers for the invitation. Today I'll be talking about toxicity in new and established HPV compounds. So here are my disclosures. So first I'm going to go through briefly toxicity of established therapy and then I'll spend most of the time talking about toxicity of new compounds, what I've divided into sort of expected and what you might describe as unexpected toxicity and then briefly talk about different populations where this might be relevant. 
So let's talk briefly about established therapy. And I think with nukes, we know that they have overall excellent long-term safety. Early on in Tecavir, there were concerns raised about lactic acidosis in patients with advanced or decompensated cirrhosis, and this doesn't seem to be a big problem. It's likely a small concern with any nuke due to potential for mitochondrial toxicity, which is greater in a very sick liver. And of course, we learned uh, too much about this with the old FIEU story uh, very early in nuke development. But clearly, this is a pretty rare phenomenon and really um, only applies to those patients with very advanced liver disease. When we look at the tenofovir therapies with TDF, the big issue is renal tubular toxicity and related uh, phosphate wasting bone toxicity. And we know that these are certainly occur, at, but at the population level are pretty rare. They're more of a, an issue for individual patients and really with good patient selection, they're less of a concern, but those with higher risk factors, older age, diabetes, hypertension, underlying renal disease, and, and longer duration of exposure are at higher risk. And if we move to TAF, we know from uh, both the comparative studies and then the switch studies that you can reduce that toxicity profile due to the lower exposures. So we still need long-term safety here, but I think uh, this looks uh, quite promising. Now, what about interferon? Um, well, we all know the many side effects that interferon can cause, um, but I think it's important to recognize that most of these are actually not treatment limiting. Most patients get through the, the planned duration of, of therapy. And, and of course, some data to suggest that therapy, interferon-based therapy might be better tolerated in hep B than in hep C. Whether that's really true is hard to say, but I think it's important to recognize that shorter therapy with interferon might be possible. So, and I think the number of three months is often thrown around as where it might be acceptable to, uh, to get patients through a shorter course as part of combination therapy. Probably the bigger challenge would be convincing providers to use uh, interferon than, uh, than getting patients to take it. So what about toxicity of new compounds? And I'm going to talk here about expected toxicity. We know we're going to see some ALT flares. Some of them are good. Um, so that's predictable. Immune-related toxicity is, is, is potentially a predictable concern. And then there might be some that are specific to compounds or specific classes of therapy. And then the more challenging one is unexpected toxicity, the idiosyncratic reactions. Now, Pietro just talked about ALT flare, so I'm only going to go through these briefly, but I think it's obviously relevant to talk about this with toxicity. So we generally think about these as therapeutic flares, the sort of good flares, and then the, the less good flares, drug-induced liver injury or immune-mediated hepatitis. And the therapeutic flares, we usually think about these being associated with viral control, suppression of virus if they're not on nukes. Um, it might lead to E antigen loss, and I think the association with E, e antigen loss is much clearer with the flares. Clearly, with S loss, it can happen, but we actually often see patients just petering out and losing S without a flare over time. Now, these flares should be by definition self-limited, but it's important to recognize that they can be severe and occasionally even fatal. Now, of course, losing S, if you lose the patient, not really a good outcome. Um, so these are good and they're what we want to see as long as they're not too severe. The other consideration with these good flares is that they can occur after stopping an effective drug. And sometimes even the stopping may lead to our therapeutic flare, but they, these again can also be uh, a bit dangerous, although nuke, uh, nuke rescue therapy might be helpful. The uh, drug-induced liver injury, typically idiosyncratic, but they may be dose dependent. Usually the mechanisms aren't known. And the challenging thing here is that in to using our usual to tools for interpreting these like High's law may be challenging with elevated ALT at baseline, but they can be severe or fatal. And aside from transplant, we don't usually have good therapeutic options. And immune mediated hepatitis, these are really uh, probably restricted to the checkpoint inhibitors, although other immunotherapies might do the same thing. They're usually rapid onset. They can be severe or even fatal. Um, fortunately, they typically are steroid responsive, um, but uh, not always. And I think we need more data here to understand them better. Clearly, biomarkers to distinguish these are currently limited, but they're desperately needed. Liver biopsy might help um, uh, in, in, in some occasions. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples where we uh, look at these ALT flares and we try to make um, <clears throat> sort of guesses about what's going on. And I think a lot of excitement about the NAPs in terms of the estoclines, really potent estoclines with these agents, um, but with significant ALT rises. And what we're hoping these mean is that this is uh, immune restoration that's leading to these ALT flares and subsequent immune control. And I think really, so hopefully that's what we're seeing, but I really do think we need to prove that with good immunological studies, both in the blood and ideally in the liver as well. And I'll talk about some tools for doing that. 
And I would highlight that this isn't unique to NAPS. We see this here with the, the GSK antisense, uh, where you see these pretty significant S declines, importantly, with very frequent dosing over a four week period. And what you see here is that in both nuke suppressed and naive patients, uh, S decline and then a very quickly following with an ALT rise. And if you look at this and you correlate them, you see that the peak ALT uh, is associated with the greatest declines in S. So what's the mechanism here? Again, we'd like to believe that this is immune restoration um, and that this is not toxicity or something else entirely, but I think we need more data here. So here, what, what can we use to try to tease this apart? Well, uh, Conan Chua, and, uh, a PhD student in, in Adam Gehring's lab uh, in our group in Toronto, has developed what I think is a nice tool for helping to tease this apart. So what he's looked at is, can you actually identify immune responses in pretty much real time. And what he's done here is you take PBMCs and you look for pooled immune responses. So this isn't telling you that someone's having a response to S or to core or uh, to, to poll, but it is telling you whether or not they're having an increase in their HPV specific global immune responses in their peripheral blood. It can be done in pretty much real time. Now we first looked at using a standard interferon gamma LE spot and he could see responses, but when he went to a three color fluoro spot, which has a couple of advantages, first of all, in vaccinated donors and and in chronic hep B patients, he saw more frequently, he could more frequently identify responses. But the other advantage is he could see polyfunctionality here by looking at interferon gamma, IL-2, and TNF-alpha. Um, this allowed him to determine the, uh, something about the quality of the, the response, just not, not only its presence or absence. So this might be a nice tool to help evaluate whether a flare is really an HPV flare or a um, or a, a toxic flare. And I'll give you an example in a moment where this might be, might be useful. Alternatively, we can actually look in the, the liver and there's been uh, accumulating data of using fine needle aspiration liver biopsy to do this. Some nice work out of Milo Maini's group um, and our group in Toronto has also done a lot of work with this approach. And it's important to recognize that you really can distinguish the liver immune uh, um, uh, signature uh, from the blood. They really do look distinct and you get reliable sampling of the intrahepatic immune compartment um, and, and it's been compared uh, with uh, Mala's group to liver biopsy showing similar uh, responses. Importantly, some limitations to consider here, the cell number's not huge, about 50,000 cells and they're mostly immune cells. So this is good for looking at immune responses, but you get a pretty limited number of hepatocytes, only about 10% and they're a variable quality. You cannot look at his histology here. This is pretty well tolerated. So you can do serial biopsies, serial FNABs, which is nice. Um, useful to have a baseline though here. And this would be nice for looking at evaluating flares and better understand them and maybe toxicity, but this is probably better for evaluating flares. So here's an example where this might have looked like these were good flares. So this is with this uh, pretty potent cam that looked like it was working pretty well. And you could see that some patients had good virologic responses, but also had ALT rises. And the first feeling is, oh, these are what we want to see. S is going down and we're seeing these ALT flares. But then when this was followed up by studies in healthy subjects, you see that these ALT flares occurred. It seemed to be restricted to Asian patients that had at least two weeks of dosing. But interestingly, this looked like it was also an immune activation flare. So you could see this IP10 interferon gamma arises in, in, in concert with the ALT increases. So you could easily see how someone could interpret these as being a beneficial uh, sort of immune active type response and not thinking of these as toxicity. Um, and, and that would be a concern. So it, it's important to recognize that you really do need to dig deep. You can't assume that these flares are good. And using some of those tools I just mentioned might be helpful. Of course, we don't know if this is unique to this agent. So far, we haven't seen it with other CAMs, but clearly we need to keep a close eye. Now, this, I think, is a useful reference from the HPV forum where they've put together some guidance about how to evaluate uh, safety in new clinical trials for new agents. And I think it is quite a useful tool, the type of workup you might want to do and things to think about in evaluating toxicity. Now, what about immune-related toxicity? Well, this has been mostly uh, studied in the checkpoint inhibitor world with PD-1, PD-L1, and CTLA-4. We know that in cancer, certainly this is sort of accepted toxicity, but we know that you do see these immune-related adverse events in almost any compartment, so almost any organ, and some of these can be very serious and even life-threatening. Um, 
And people have thought about using reduced doses for something like in well-controlled hep B where the, the, the need is less clear. Uh, but it's important to remember that the risks are likely more related to receptor occupancy than dose. So I think we really need more data on what is the frequency of these when you use lower doses. And I think one of the things we should really look to the cancer world from, because there's a vast experience here, can we select our patients uh, more effectively to reduce the risk of these? Is there ability to do on-treatment monitoring to help find that sweet spot? Because this could be an attractive tool, but we really need to be careful because the toxicity can be, uh, can be, quite, uh, uh, can be quite drastic. And I think it's a question of, can this occur with other immunomodulatory therapies? We don't really know. So uh, how do we know? Well, we'd like to be able to predict this. Unfortunately, like with most things, as with this election, we're not so good at looking forward in time. In hindsight, we can look back and say, oh, we should have seen that coming, but not always uh, so, so easy to predict the future. And this was best exemplified by this example where inorigavir looked like a potent HPV drug uh, and looked like a novel uh, approach. Um, it looked promising until it didn't. With ALT in, uh, elevations were seen with increasing uh, dose duration, 40% at week eight, almost 90% by week 16 of dosing. And then you see this one patient with severe pancreatitis, lactic acidosis, liver failure, seven patients admitted, one died. Um, and importantly, some of these patients did actually have responses. So again, you gotta be careful to not get too excited by a response and say that toxicity can't also be occurring. Toxicity seemed to be duration related, but it wasn't obvious until it was obvious. So this is again, challenging about uh, trying to predict the future here and AL, mild ALT elevations were initially thought to be a good thing. So really understanding the mechanism here will be important to guide future therapies. What about compound or class specific toxicity? And I think with the uh, antisense approach of siRNA or antisense, it's really important to think about off-target mismatches. And the FDA has given some guidance here that you've got to look in both the human and mitochondrial transcriptome to look for possible matches and then monitor toxicity specifically where those matches might occur. And then also think about polymorphisms that might uh, be different by uh, race or ethnicity. And then I think it's important when you're thinking about longer term therapy, about whether the frequency or duration of these therapies will affect normal um, uh, microRNA processing or RNA's H function within the cell. And, um, you know, there are approved agents in these classes, so hopefully that's not an issue, but I think we need to keep an open mind. And then you need to think about host targets, and probably the best example here is Mercludex B, where it also inhibits bile acid uptake. Um, and of course, short-term inhibition seems to not be a problem, but what about if you have to give this as long-term chronic therapy, does that become a bigger issue? So unexpected toxicity, of course, by its nature, it's unexpected. Uh, it's, it's hard to predict hepatic or uh, other uh, idiosyncratic reactions elsewhere. Um, we are getting better at model systems for predicting this in the liver, but they're still not great. Um, and I think this does sort of make a case for shortening duration of therapy, as was seen within Irigavir, that these can be dose or duration related. And this was also exemplified by the BMS uh, HCV polymerase inhibitor, um, where with longer dosing wasn't seen uh, in in um, in uh, short term dosing, and it really does make the case for long term animal toxicity studies to make sure you don't see these uh, effects, um, uh, and they're more predictable. Um, the FDA does recommend storing DNA to see if you can see genetic associations if these occur. Predicting off targets effect. Uh, this was an, an old study uh, that was published in Nature, which was uh, really looking to identify uh, ways to repurpose drugs. So you knew you had a mechanism. Could you think about how you might be able to repurpose a drug? But it can also be useful for identifying possible toxicity, where if you find toxicity, you might be able to say, how is this? What's the mechanism here? Can I tweak a drug that had a promising uh, look to it uh, to make it to take away that toxicity risk, uh, but keep the uh, active antiviral effect? So I think uh, using Using this approach, and this this was a, mind, a primarily bioinformatic approach, but but has been uh, useful for a, a streamlining promising drugs. And then about the population, cirrhosis is a group where clearly the greatest need, but also the biggest risk, and they'll probably be studied last, um, but, um, and it may not be appropriate for certain types of therapy at all, particularly the immunotherapies where tipping patients over to liver failure might be a risk. 
Same thing might be said for the elderly, where clearly we need to treat these patients, but immunotherapy might be a challenge, both in terms of response and toxicity. And I think with the pediatric group, we'll probably do what we usually do is uh, look for safety in adults first, except for maybe pediatric targeted therapies like in the IT population. Pregnancy, probably less of a focus for HPV cure because of our existing safety uh, with nukes and vaccine. So to summarize, uh, current therapies with fewer no AEs and very limited long-term toxicity raise the bar for new therapies. And safety probably needs to be comparable to NERCs. Nukes with short-term AEs may be acceptable if they have, but uh, and with, for high surface antigen loss, but true toxicity, not so much. And careful evaluation of toxicity is clearly critical. Uh, ALT evaluations will be the most challenging. I highlighted a few new tools, the fluorospot and FNAB. Um, keeping an open mind for other toxicity will be key and really trying to understand the mechanism will be important. Um, and, and I think limiting duration would be a, a wise approach as much as possible. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Jordan. Um, this is a very um, nice talk um, on a very um, complicated um, topic. Uh, and as you know, with um, the challenge with um, hepatitis B treatment is always comparison to what we have right now. Uh, the nukes are very safe, so the bar is set very high. And these um, players um, really terrify us. Uh, although um, those of us who've been involved with um, interferon therapy way back in the past know that, well, you have to sometimes see some players. Um, and once you talk about the immunology um, studies, that's very um, interesting and exciting. Um, but Again, I mean, it may not necessarily be that all of these um, players are related to um, immunology. And um, a, uh, and I'm not sure that uh, even though this might provide insight, would necessarily help us um, understand um, the uh, pathogenesis of all of these um, players. So what is your advice in terms of um, really when you're doing the clinical trials, uh, whether you should stop because um, this is a, going to be a um, life-threatening player um, or push on because you don't want to give up too early either. Yeah, that, that's a great, <laughs> a great question. And, and I think for sure a challenge with all of these new therapies that we know that some of these flares really might be necessary to see the benefit. And I think this, the point that I would make are one is, and I think everyone's doing this, is start with safe populations. So start with people with mild fibrosis, where if you see a flare, they can hopefully tolerate that flare. Uh, secondly, characterize your flares very well. Um, I, I think you're probably right that you do have to have, like we've learned in the stopping arena where you have to be able to see a bit of a flare, you're not gonna see any benefit. If you, if you put people, if you stop treatment as soon as you see the ALT bump at all, you're gonna potentially miss really important activity. So I would say that. But I, I would really encourage ancillary studies, probably in subsets of patients, to try to understand these flares better, whether they're, as you, you're right, that it may not all be immune mediated, but I think there's sort of this assumption that these ALT flares are good and, uh, and that's not always been really borne out with data. So I think we need better data there. And then I think, you know, some of the groups have really developed um, panels, sort of like you do a DSMC, to evaluate flares in a very careful manner in real time as trials are going on. And, and I think it's a, something where there may be some adjustment and ad adaptation as we learn more, where we learn to be able to tolerate what we can and what we can't tolerate uh, as we learn more about these agents. But uh, yeah, we, we've got to keep an open mind for sure. Well, thank you, Jordan. So our next talk uh, would um, continue to dive into this very important topic. Uh, and this is some, from a different perspective. Um, and um, our next speaker, is um, Dr. Poonam um, Mishra um, from the FDA. Uh, she's currently the Deputy Director for Safety um, in the Division of Antivirals uh, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Um, we couldn't um, expect to find a better person um, to help guide us um, on this topic of safety monitoring uh, for investigational um, HPV drugs uh, and um, when we should um, consider this continuation of these um, therapies. Um, Dr. Mishra? Good morning. I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present today. Here is my disclaimer slide. I'll start with a brief overview of safety assessment during clinical development, focusing on general guidelines for safety monitoring during trials and key considerations in regulatory decision-making during new drug review process. In the second half of my talk, 
I intend to provide a high level, generally applicable approach to safety monitoring in hepatitis B clinical trials. And we'll end with brief discussion of discontinuation of HBV treatment in clinical trials aimed at finite duration therapies. The focus of safety evaluation during drug development is to characterize and quantify the safety profile of a drug during clinical trials, avoiding unreasonable or unnecessary risk to trial participants is paramount. Assessment of risk and risk mitigation is done as part of benefit risk assessment during comprehensive review of the pre-marketing application. Pre-marketing surveillance is an integral part of drug's life cycle. We may identify new safety signals or identify more serious or more frequent reports of a known safety risk during the post-approval period. Once a drug is used more widely and under more diverse conditions in a real-world setting, Let's start with safety review for first in human trials. The purpose of this safety review is to reach a determination if the proposed clinical trial is safe to proceed. Review of available non-clinical data and toxicology studies is done to assess whether it supports the proposed clinical program, including the proposed dose and duration. Focus is on seeking the minimum effective dose necessary to test the scientific hypothesis. Limiting duration of exposure in initial trials and selection of appropriate study populations to exclude at-risk populations in initial trials. Review of clinical protocol is done to determine if there is a plan for adequate safety monitoring for organ toxicities, whether these toxicities are clinically monitorable or manageable in trial settings and if there is a follow-up plan for delayed toxicities in human trials. This slide outlines some of the key considerations when developing safety monitoring plans for phase two or three trials. The protocol should include pre-specified safety monitoring and assessment plan based on non-clinical data, PKPD data, and early phase trial findings. Safety should be demonstrated at the lower doses prior to dose escalation. Staggered enrollments into cohorts should be considered based on demonstrated safety in the earlier cohort. Having relevant drug-drug interaction information is important. Target population for the trial should be reasonable to avoid risk to vulnerable subpopulations. Any dose-limiting toxicity should be considered and adequately monitored, and dose modification guidelines should be clearly outlined in the protocol. Pre-specified stopping rules should be incorporated into the study's protocol related to safety endpoints, both for individual subjects and for overall trial. Specific safety monitoring may be needed based on known safety issues in a drug class and to assess potential for overlapping toxicities with individual drugs in the combination regimen. Pre-specified interim safety assessments and independent data safety monitoring boards review of ongoing data may help in making prompt decisions if new safety concern is identified during clinical trials. Benefit risk assessment during drug review is a systematic process to assess the benefits and risks of a drug in support of the regulatory decision. This assessment is informed by many factors as shown in this benefit risk framework including but not limited to the severity of the underlying condition and how well patients' medical needs are addressed by currently available therapies, including effectiveness, safety, and tolerability of available therapies. And are there any benefits provided over existing therapies? These provide therapeutic context for weighing the drug's benefits and risks. A thorough and comprehensive assessment of drug safety and efficacy is informed by the clinical trials data. Assessment of risk involves overall understanding of product safety profile. What are the most important identified safety concerns? Are there any specific risks that may require risk management beyond product labeling, such as post-marketing safety studies to further characterize the safety concerns? Safe is interpreted as the determination that a drug benefits outweigh its potential risk to the intended population. 
In summary, benefit-risk assessment takes into consideration therapeutic effect and demonstrated safety or tolerability profile of the new investigational agent in the context of underlying disease and current treatment options available. Moving on to safety monitoring in hepatitis C clinical trials. The general principles I discussed earlier apply to hepatitis C clinical trials as well. One of the unique challenges with hepatitis B trials is assessment of hepatic flares. For example, to discern immune clearance associated flares from signal of potential drug-induced liver injury is challenging. Three different broad categories of flares, which are listed on the slide, were proposed at the EASL ASLD HBV endpoint workshop held last year in London. As we all know, predicting the severity of hepatic flares is difficult. Close monitoring of low-grade ART elevations is necessary to monitor trends. Specific criteria for defining and monitoring of hepatic flares during treatment and after stopping therapy should be well characterized. Severe flares with deterioration in synthetic and excretory functions can be serious and life-threatening, particularly in patients with advanced liver disease. Adverse events of death or liver transplantation, hepatic decompensation, Irreversible autoimmunity or cases of severe hepatitis flare are major safety concerns. Now let's focus on systematic assessment of liver safety in hepatitis B trials. A working group led by Dr. Fontana, which had multi-stakeholder participation, published certain consensus recommendations late last year. These recommendations include guidance on evaluation and management of liver safety signals during clinical trials. I would like to emphasize that it is crucial that systematic data collection is done during clinical trials and full workup is done to rule out alternative causes of liver injury for a thorough causality assessment. Certain criteria for treatment interruption or discontinuation are also discussed in this paper. Consideration should also be given to convening an independent expert adjudication panel that may play an important role in assessing drug hepatotoxicity profile during clinical development. I'll spend next few minutes talking about observed adverse events with immunotherapeutic agents. I would emphasize that safety monitoring plans should consider mechanism of action of the drug as there may be different safety concerns associated with specific drugs. Cytokine release syndrome has been reported with T cell engaging therapies. It is a supraphysiologic response to immune therapy that activates T cells or other immune effector cells. Cytokine release syndrome is an acute systemic inflammatory response characterized by a wide spectrum of clinical manifestations. A more severe syndrome may result in multi-organ system failure. It is important to note that the risk, time of onset, and duration may vary depending on the type of agent being evaluated. Now moving on to immune-mediated adverse reactions, which have been reported with immunotherapies such as immune checkpoint inhibitors. These adverse reactions can be clinically significant and potentially fatal. This figure shows the various manifestations across organ systems. Frequency of adverse reactions is dependent on specific agent or combination of agents being used. Duration of exposure and the total dose. Intrinsic host factors may also play a role. Treatment often includes immunosuppression, or hormone replacement therapy. This slide lists some of the considerations when evaluating oligonucleotide-based investigational drugs. In regard to observed adverse events, severe thrombocytopenia has been reported with some antisense oligonucleotides. Peripheral neuropathy and mortality has been observed with an siRNA drug. Of note, some of the potential off-target binding by these drugs could lead to species-specific toxicities 
which may not be detected in toxicology studies. Appropriate in silico and in vitro methods should be used for off-target assessments to identify potential off-target mismatches. In certain scenarios, the toxicity of the excipients in the formulation may characterize the overall toxicity profile of the investigational drug. As we know, there is a lot of interest in the field towards development of new finite duration treatment regimens. In next two slides, I will focus on the discontinuation of HBV treatment in the context of clinical trials evaluating finite therapies. In general, when evaluating finite duration therapies, off treatment refers to discontinuation of all drugs, investigational agent, as well as any background NRTI therapy. There are safety concerns regarding stopping NRTI therapy in virally suppressed patients on stable treatment regimen. Hence, criteria for stopping therapy at the end of the investigational treatment period should be well defined in the protocol and should be based on clinically validated biomarkers to ensure that discontinuation of therapy does not pose undue safety risks to the trial participants. Use of novel biomarkers such as HBV RNA or decline in surface antigen levels as a trigger for treatment interruption should be supported by strong scientific rationale and should be discussed with the FDA in advance of trial initiation. Scientific consensus is much needed on appropriate topping criteria in the context of clinical trials. To demonstrate sustained response of treatment, the duration of treatment consolidation period needed after achieving surface antigen loss on treatment needs to be systematically assessed during clinical trials. Of note, this may vary based on the mechanism of action and half-life of a specific investigational drug being evaluated. Severe acute exacerbations of HBV infection may occur after discontinuation of anti-hepatitis B therapy, particularly in the absence of surface antigen loss. Pre-specified criteria or plan for frequent clinical and laboratory monitoring for flares is critical. In certain circumstances, resumption of hepatitis B therapy may be warranted. Detailed plan for treatment reinitiation should be pre-specified in the clinical trial protocol. Long duration of follow-up is needed for patients who remain off therapy both for safety assessment and for durability of response. Known and potential risk of investigational drug, as well as pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic characteristics should inform additional safety monitoring and duration of follow-up. As we look forward to research and development in the area of possible finite duration therapies for hepatitis B, it is very important we hear directly from patients to understand how patients view the benefits and risks of therapies for hepatitis B. Hepatitis B Foundation convened a patient-focused drug development meeting earlier this year. This meeting provided an important opportunity to hear directly from patients, their families, their caregivers, and patient advocacy groups. Enhancing understanding of patient preferences, and the potential acceptab acceptability of trade-offs, risk and risk outcomes should help inform the focus of new drug development and future clinical trials. To conclude, FDA monitors and reviews safety information about the drug throughout the product life cycle. Benefit risk assessment is the foundation for FDA's regulatory review of human drugs and biologics. Safety of a drug is assessed by determining whether its expected benefits outweigh its potential risk in the context of the disease and available therapeutic options. Multidisciplinary assessment is key in assessing safety risk during every phase of drug life cycle. 
change in safety monitoring plan may be warranted based on the emerging data during trials. Patient-focused drug development is crucial in moving the field forward. Engaging and collaborative discussions between academia, industry, regulatory agencies, and patient advocacy groups are essential to inform the overall drug development. FDA remains committed to facilitate the development of safe and effective therapies for hepatitis B to help millions of people that are affected with the disease globally. Thank you. I can address any questions you have during the panel discussion. Dr. Mishra for, uh, again, an outstanding yeah, talk uh, on the uh, safety development of hepatitis B. Yeah, uh, and so we can start with the first uh, question. So what would be the FDA's advice uh, in the era of COVID-19 when we can't closely monitor patients in clinical trials who may be fearful of coming back for frequent uh, blood draws for safety uh, events? and even the uh, study uh, monitors and CROs who uh, have to now perform uh, remote monitoring of, of sites uh, because of restrictions uh, due to COVID and, and clinic uh, closures. How can we modify your, your, your uh, treatment uh, or your safety monitoring plan uh, in COVID-19? Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, that's a very important question and a big challenge these days, uh, as you know, everyone is, uh, dealing with this ongoing um, you know, pandemic. And FDA has um, issued a guidance to, you know, for sponsors, um, suggesting some of the things which can be done uh, for the ongoing trials. So there are you know, recommendations in that guidance, what can be done, what things can be done virtually, how they can use you know, things like you know, telemedicine, how they can follow up with patients with phone call, what are, you know, labs which can be done uh, safely and things like that. So we did issue a guidance early on. It's just not specific to hepatitis B particularly, but overall clinical trial performance and how to evaluate and how to, you know, deal with the current situation. So I would suggest just people can look, take a look at it. Thank you for that. I think it's very important, particularly when we're doing a clinical trial and there's a safety concern and many of us had that experience early on, uh, earlier this year with one of the, med the medications that was uh, mentioned earlier in clinical trials. Uh, and it was a, a lot of extra work for, for the clinics, uh, for the patients and the sites, particularly when you're thinking of discontinuing a drug uh, for safety uh, concerns. Yeah, I would add that in any of these situations, uh, you know, we are very flexible and I would recommend that, you know, sponsors reach out to us, sponsors, investigators, anyone having a challenging issue, they reach out directly to us and, you know, we can guide them for their specific situation. So we're very flexible, we're very open, you know, people can reach out to us directly. Thank you for the, the, the guidance. And so with that, uh, I think uh, we'd like to open it up now. Uh, to for the general questions, and I'll ask my co-moderator, Professor Locke, uh, to also uh, to join in to help moderate the, the question and answer session for the next uh, uh, 30 minutes. Yeah, we'd like to thank um, everyone uh, for um, excellent talks um, on um, an evolving topic. Uh, and obviously, a um, major focus is really on safety. Uh, and um, how do we know whether flares are um, good flares, Bad flares and um, how do we monitor? Um, so um, while we're waiting for questions um, from the um, audience, uh, and I don't seem to see any questions from the audience at this time in the chat room. Oh, there is um, a question. Um, this is actually a great um, question from um, Adam um, Gary. Um, so recognizing that. With all these um, desire to achieve HDV cure, we're not going to rely on monotherapy. We're going to have some um, combination therapy. Uh, in particular, if we're combining two new drugs, um, so some of these um, involve triple combination, um, how do we know if we see a flare? Which drug is causing the flare? And do we stop all three drugs or do we stop one at a time? Um, so guessing which one is the most likely culprit. 
Um, so maybe um, Fabian or um, um, Pietro first, and then um, we'll see what um, Punam um, would um, have to say. And maybe Jordan as well. So any one of you want to sort of um, take the first um, crack what to do when there are multiple drugs? Well, uh, I, I don't have the final answer, but I would think that uh, if you go to a multiple, triple or quadruple study design, hopefully each single drug has been you know, fully investigated in terms of safety before as a monotherapy. And hopefully uh, you got already some questions, some, some, some data in terms of dual combination. So uh, hopefully, you know, uh, Mm, there will not much probably of this problem, hopefully in the future. Uh, but uh, to answer which one will be stopped first, uh, I think it's impossible uh, to give an answer. You know, if you really get something which is unexpected uh, in a you know phase two trial or even earlier, I would stop everything at that time point. Maybe not the oral therapy in terms of nuke, maybe. Yeah, maybe um, Purnam, you can um, help address that um, because I know that um, um, early on, um, the um, when this was um, brought up, <clears throat> if I understand correctly, um, FDA and EMA basically said it. If there's no expected drug interactions, we don't necessarily need to study um, safety of um, the different combinations. But sometimes a particular drug may be safe as when used as a monotherapy, um, and it's only a problem when you start combining them. Um, and how well can we always predict whether there's any interaction? So as you know, Anna, this is like the most challenging question because we can't predict. And that's why it's so important to monitor closely, go slow, as I said, you know, staggered cohorts, enroll few cohorts, few patients and few subjects, and then see how they do. And then maybe, you know, escalate to broader enrollment and things like that. So, yeah, it is very challenging to predict. Maybe, you know, we can learn from phase one trials where usually, you know, one, uh, one drug is being evaluated before they're combined in like phase two with multiple drugs. So things like that can be done. But of course, as all of us know, it's very difficult to predict. You know, we can learn from what we know about that class of drugs in other therapeutic areas. Sometimes, you know, drugs are being used in other therapeutic areas and now they are being proposed for hepatitis B. So we know a little bit from safety profile in other areas. So things like that could be done. We can start with the lower dose and see how it works out. Sometimes, you know, idiosyncratic side effects might not, you know, the dose might not matter. But, you know, those are the things which can be done um, to safeguard the, you know, patient safety. But, of course, you know, close monitoring and be very vigilant while the trial is ongoing will be the key. I see that there are additional questions. So, uh, Scott, maybe you want to... Okay, well, that next question is, uh, I guess, more of a clinical biomarker question to Fabienne. Uh, what is the value of hepatitis B RNA and correlated uh, antigen? I guess in clinical practice, it's from Harry. Yeah, I mean that's uh, an important question that we 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 have now. I mean, when we are developing all the all these new new therapies, and we um, and we know that HB, HBS loss is not easy to to achieve, so we like to to have. Uh, biomarker that would predict the uh, the decline of um, of HBS early on, so that we we could take a decision whether we, uh, there is a new strategy that is in investigated can be continued or should should be should be withdrawn. Um, so the um, um, viral RNA and, and correlated antigen are are quite interesting because they 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 are uh, at least for pregenomic RNA. Uh, uh, and not all RNAs, so uh, really pregenomic RNA and the correlated antigen um, are thought to predict the, uh, the the pool of CCC DNA in the liver. So, so if um, a decline in, in this biomarker is observed, and this could predict the uh, a decline in CCC DNA that may also predict a subsequent HBS decline. Um, however, 
uh, we have to keep in mind that, uh, first of all, this has not yet been fully demonstrated in, in clinical studies, and this needs to be uh, uh, assessed uh, and evaluated carefully in a, pro in a prospective manner. So that's the first point. And the second point is that, um, depending on the mode of action of the drug, um, these biomarkers may be affected by the, 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 the mechanism, mechanism of action and, and, and may not be uh, um, a, a true endpoint, I mean, or, or prediction of the endpoint. Uh, so we have to be very careful. So for instance, an siRNA uh, uh, would, would be predicted to, to, to decrease the uh, circulating RNA uh, in, in, in serum. And this would not mean uh, uh, per se that th this is going to, uh, to lead to a clearance of CCC DNA. So, so this may be, but this, these are two different questions. One is target engagement, and the other one is, is the endpoint evaluation or prediction. So still a lot of work to, to be done, and to be done very carefully uh, and systematically uh, before we can draw a conclusion and the right interpretation of the data. Can I add on with one quick question, uh, uh, Fabien? So HBS engine might not be our best endpoint because an E-negative is produced by integrated DNA at all. Do you think that HB-correlated antigen and HB-DRNA might, might become an endpoint in our treatments at all? You, you kind of partly answered the question, but there is a really unmet need on how to define our off-treatment response, our functional cure. Right? So, so what specific role would those yeah. play? Uh, and we've seen, I mean, that's a, a great question. And, we, and we've seen with, a, I mean, the very recent press release from, from Assembly where they, 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 um, they did this experiment, this important study where they, they stopped they, they stop the, uh, the combination of NUC and, and CAM based on, on the results of, of biomarkers. So uh, RNA and DNA were, were undetectable and uh, in those selected patients and they stopped. Um, 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 uh, and we've seen that there was there was a relapse and in, in in all these patients. So I think there are issues regarding um, the, and I'm speaking really broadly. I mean, independently on of the drugs and and, and companies and so on, is really um, the um, validation of the as of the assays. Um, we we see a lot of publications and and communication on different type of assays and we, we need to be very careful on uh, on the validation uh, and there are some guidance to to validate an, an assay before you can use it in a clinical trial uh, to to predict the outcome so uh, there are issues regarding sensitivity as well so so far i think we we it's really too early and and it, uh, from what we, we start to see now is, is that we, we may be in a situation that we need um, um, a composite uh, uh, evaluation with different biomarkers. So, so this is where the field is, is going now, but it, it, it's, it's like the, the, the drugs. We have so many drugs um, and we don't know where, how to combine them. And I think we, we are at the same stage now for the biomarkers and they are still improving. So, so it's a very exciting a uh, moment. So um, this is a very good point, uh, Fabian, uh, because we now look at all these um, new markers um, to guide us um, to determine whether we are on target um, with the new drugs and whether um, this help um, in assessing whether we're getting a cure. But um, different drugs have different mechanisms of action. Uh, and the meaning of a dramatic drop in one marker with one group of drugs may not be the same as another. Uh, and similarly, although most of us are very excited when we see S antigen loss, um, but um, with drugs that uh, specifically um, like the siRNA um, that knock down production of S antigen, uh, I mean, does it really uh, mean that the CCC DNA is eradicated? Maybe not. Um, just um, sort of um, knocking down the um, production of the viral protein. So this um, might be, mean that um, the next few years, uh, we might um, have more sort of a um, personalized approach um, according to the classes of drugs and not necessarily one approach um, to um, any combination. Um, and if I may, if I may uh, Anna, I mean, this is a very important point. I think the uh, at some point, um, when um, there are proof of concept studies, 
such, such as the one you know that was done. I mean, where we heard recently from uh, the results of the uh, stopping uh, strategy of um, uh, of assembly. Uh, what what is would be really important in, in that type of proof of concept studies where you have highly selected patients is really to have also an assessment of the liver compartment so that we can make a good interpretation of the results afterwards. Um, otherwise, it's kind of now we we are a little bit uh, in a uh, complicated situation to, to see what, uh, how to interpret the, their results. We obviously we, we, we lack the uh, a longer follow up because good things may happen with a longer follow up after their treatment cessation. So it's too too early. But still, I mean, from the at the time of cessation, it would have been good to have the uh, an assessment of the liver compartment. I think Pietro, you have a question, right? Uh, yes, uh, I have a question for Adam as an immunologist. Um, so uh, some of the data I showed today, but some of the data have been also showed by others, suggesting that if you drop down S antigen level by three to four logs in, let's say, three weeks in nuke suppressed patients, uh, you might see a flare which is moderate after S antigen is negative. Uh, and the question could be, is that a perfect uh, pattern for uh, immune reconstitution, let's say, although these were agents, E antigen negative, uh, probably with exhausted immune system, is that possible? Well, you know, it's, it, it, are you talking specifically about the ASO data here or? Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is uh, this data is fascinating, and it's it's kind of hard to understand exactly what kind of immunological mechanisms are happening there. I mean, clearly, you know, there's there is immunopathology happening. Um, whether that's induction of, say, uh, a T cell response or a triggering of an effective innate response um, that's clearing these hepatocytes, you know, we don't have the data to really tell that. But you know, it really sh it really does indicate that. You know, there is, and, and, you know, we have to look more at least at the plasma in these patients to see what their cytokine profiles look like, um, see if it can be correlated more with antiviral versus inflammatory. And really, T cell response or intrahepatic sampling is going to be key to this. So I really do think that there is some kind of induction of immunity here that we are seeing this effective response because it's unlikely a drug of that mechanism would lead to direct killing of the hepatocytes or um, or their cytotoxicity. So, you know, we definitely have an immune involvement, but I don't know exactly what branch of the immune system that would be at this point. So, um, it would be very interesting. From, uh, from the immunological point of view, and then I will finish. Uh, I mean, I mean, does it make sense, or is, it is that much better to achieve a very fast? Uh, and in a very short period decline of S, because many studies are really looking to weeks or months of therapy. So, so uh, I guess probably, you know, a very short period could be potentially better than a long period. Is that, does it make any sense from your point of view? I mean, it is striking and certainly a shorter duration of treatment would be advantageous for everyone. Um, you know, the flares were, were quite significant. But you know, we, we I would I would draw this sort of the kinetics seem very much like um, those we see in acute hepatitis B, you know, this kind of decline in viral load and the and the LT coming up after. So um, you know, it, it it may be feasible to have this short window. But again, I think there were a few patients presented in that study, and and um, you know, the longer term treatments so far with the sRNA drugs, where they're also reducing the S antigen, don't so such a dramatic effect. So there's clearly something different about the mechanism of action between these two drugs that have a similar end result where they're knocking down RNA and they're knocking down antigen. One is not really inducing this inflammatory response of liver damage and the other one is. And in the one that is, you're seeing much more dramatic S declines. So, um, you know, it's it's very interesting, contrasting results to it. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to actually studying quite a bit. Great, thanks, Adam. So there's another uh, question. Here's a question from Bob Gish. It was uh, addressed to Henry, but Henry has already signed off, I think, because of the time zone uh, difference. Uh, but it's really asking about the role of CCC DNA, what it, whether it would be useful, I guess, as part of uh, 
uh, as a measurement, again, in combination therapy, how would we apply that uh, maybe to Jordan or any of the other uh, molecular experts in the crowd? Yeah, I mean, it, I think obviously the, the question of how to figure out how to work CCC DNA or some measure of it into our evaluation is critical, but I, I think the one important distinction is CCC DNA quantity versus functional activity. And I think we, uh, sometimes those are used interchangeably. And I, I would say, although we would like to see CCC DNA clearance, what we really want to see is CCC DNA silencing as a first step. And so that's where we hope uh, the HPV RNA and, and correlated antigen are, are giving us at least a readout. And I, and I would put the capsids as a bit separate for the point of the mechanism of action and really meaning target engagement there. But in any other therapy, uh, they are probably a marker of at least, well, I guess the sRNAs also are not necessarily silencing. So you have to be a bit careful about interpreting what it, what they mean. I, I'm, you know, measuring CCC DNA is very challenging. Um, so it's not just looking at whether it's functionally active, but if you want to get a good measure of it in the liver, uh, lots of different labs have looked at this. Um, ICE HPV has done a nice job of trying to pull these together and come up with um, protocols that are as reliable as they can be, but even with, but I think it's still with caveats that any measure of CCC DNA, A, is going to require a liver biopsy, and B, with the best assays you do and the most and agreement among all experts, you're still going to have variability in because of sampling, because of processing in terms of measurement of CCC DNA. So I think what's probably better is to be able to look at a marker of functional CCC DNA. And, um, you know, I, th I think the markers we have are okay, but clearly sensitivity is a challenge. Clearly their target engagement issues are a challenge. One question that I, I was actually going to ask Fabian, which maybe I'll just direct it now is, you know, the focus has been on correlated antigen, but could we, act, like, I think really the goal is actually to measure core, not, and, and to get E out of the question and get P22 out of the question. And what are the, technical challenges of actually measuring core because we know that's a pretty good marker of transcription of CCC DNA when you look at liver biopsies and just core antigen expression in, on biomimetohistochemistry. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, uh, Jordan. I think the uh, uh, actually it's just a, a, an historical uh, uh, issue. It's, it's, it's just because the, the assay was not, was not developed for, for that purpose uh, at, at that time. Uh, so, so um, um, and, and I think we, um, we we are just using it because it, it does exist, and 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 it, and it proved to be interesting in in terms of predicting the uh, the the, uh, uh, the functional activity of the of CCC DNA. But but you, we we are all aware of the caveat of this of this assay, and a, a, a much more precise assay would 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 be to 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 measure core. Uh, and I think that there are no major issues, I mean, in, in, in doing that. Uh, uh, and that would be much, much easier to, uh, for, for interpretation. And we, we, don't, we wouldn't have the, the issue of, the, uh, of patients being E positive and, 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 and so on. So that, that would make, make much more sense. We, we would still need to have improvement in the sensitivity because this is uh, really a, a, an issue um, with, with this assay. But Can I ask a question to, to Fabian? Uh, yes, sure. Fabian, but why do we need uh, um, a core antigen test if you have uh, uh, a pre-genomic RNA test, which is already available and probably will be kind of available, you know, officially and uh, in, in a short time? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is part of, um, uh, of the development of the assays. I mean, you, you, uh, at this point, we, we don't know we, which one we will perform best. Um, so, you know, we, we have to be, um, we have to be also very, very, very cautious uh, until you have the full demonstration that uh, a given biomarker um, evaluated by a given assay, validated assay, I'm really, um, will provide you the, um, uh, the information on, on the prediction of HBS loss in, in clinical studies with new mode of actions and so on. I mean, we, we, there's a lot of work to be done. So, so uh, and as for drugs, there will be many drugs falling uh, and we have seen that already. So, and for assays, it will be also the same. 
Um, and in the end, we may also need a, a, a composite, you know, uh, evaluation. Who knows? I mean, that's so. So far, it's really early. I mean, we 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 have to see it as a kind of a pipeline of biomarkers, and we may also need to develop others. You know, that's uh, and not stay with what what is uh, uh, currently being uh, uh, investigated. But Pietro, I would also add that I think that there is the, the diff. They do mean slightly different things. I mean, they are both arguably a, a marker of transcription of CCC DNA. But um, by looking by measuring a protein versus an RNA, so you already have like a stability issue. So may have the because the mechanism is going to impact one and not others. So I mean, capsids are the clear example where it's going to affect packaging, but shouldn't affect the quantity of core um, that's present. So so that that would give you different readouts. And so for example, when someone's on a capsid, it's very hard to interpret the the, uh, the pgRNA. It doesn't. I don't know what it means really. Um, whereas in that context, you could use a capsid. So I, I think. Uh, or a core uh, assay. So I, I think there may be value to both because they are measuring at least slightly different things. Okay, can I ask a question, uh, Scott, maybe to, uh, uh, to Jordan? Yes, please uh, go ahead, Harry. So, so Jordan, do you think that the immune-related toxicity of the checkpoint inhibitors are really, would hamper us from, from developing this further in, I say, a relatively benign disease like hepatitis B. A lot of companies are, are reluctant to move along, and um, you touched on that a little bit, but, but what is your guess on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a tricky area. It's definitely a tricky area, and I think uh, there should be some caution here because uh, clearly it makes sense in the oncology world with um, metastatic cancer. Um, it's it's less clear, and the bar is very clearly quite high in Hep B because our main reason for HPV cure is really to get people off therapy and, and to reduce the risk of cancer uh, in the long term. But again, in the sh we really want to avoid short term toxicity, which is what you see with these checkpoint inhibitors, and it can be very severe. I think I, I mean one of the things that I've been surprised about uh, looking at the data is that it's not as easy to predict as you would imagine. So people. I mean, you can anticipate that certainly people with circulating autoantibodies and known lupus or something are going to have a higher incidence of this than the general population. But when you start to take people and you exclude those people, really, at least from what's been done in the oncology world, and I, and I would say, because I have spent a fair bit of time looking at this, they, they haven't in my mind, done a great job at really digging deep to predict who, who it occurs in. Because when you look at severe immune-related toxicity, it's only about between one and 5% of people who get checkpoints. So it's not, that, that means that the majority don't. And if you could identify who those are, either by GWAS, by looking at other biomarkers to predict that, um, then you could potentially identify what I sort of said was this sweet spot of being able to use these because they clearly are very potent immune activators. And we know this is an area where you've got a very exhausted immune system. So I think uh, from a would they work perspective, it sounds like a very promising point. The other thing I would say would be interesting to see is if you could get a more targeted uh, immune exhaustion reversal. So if you could target it to your HPV specific compartment rather than looking at it as a global immune uh, checkpoint inhibitor. And um, I don't know if Adam, if anyone's doing that, but it would seem to me that it, it, it's, it's not simple. I think technically very difficult, especially because of the small number of circulating HPV specific uh, cells that you could find. But if you could, if you could turn on the right cells and not turn on all the cells, uh, you might be less exposed to this. So I think in the, in the short term, what we have right now, the tools are a bit blunt. And as I mentioned, the dose is not a simple way to look at it. If you remember that nivolumab study that a few, a few people mentioned this morning, they did use a lower dose than is used in cancer, uh, but they actually did see pretty high target engagement. Um, it was a really small study, so they didn't see toxicity, uh, but it seems that toxicity correlates better with target engagement than it does with dose. So whether that is gonna translate to better safety profile to me is not so clear. Adam, I don't know if you Second want to ask. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's really no, at this point, you know, to, to my knowledge, no targeted um, delivery to HPV-specific T cells. I mean, I think probably the best or at least the most targeted are probably some of the small molecule um, drugs that would be at least taken orally. So they would filter through the, through the gut and into the liver instead of systemic infusion. Um, 
Yes. So, Do you think it's feasible to target uh, the like the HCV, HPV compartment? I mean, th those th those T cells clearly exist. They're just the, the frequency is relatively low, and and they have at least. I mean, I guess depending on who you ask, they're more or less exhausted. But <laughs> yeah, I, I not at this point. Not that I'm aware of, um, because I mean, even within the body, they probably make up a minority of the PD1 positive cells, at least in the circulation. It's still sort of unclear. They might. They definitely make up a higher proportion in the liver. Um, so trying to target as much to the liver as possible is probably at least the first step uh, in terms of in terms of getting at these specifically. So either the orally de delivered um, small molecules or there's this other technology, the lachnoclytic acids that are trying to target the pdl one expression in the liver. So there are ways to at least make it more organ specific, but I don't know if there's really strategies to make it T cell specific in this case. Can I move on to a more a, a clinical question in the last uh, five minutes here? Uh, every year at this meeting, I think Pietro gets asked about the, the ESO 2017 uh, guidelines, but this is really more of a question uh, for Henry, who is unfortunately signed off already, but should we be treating all of the immune tolerant patients just because they're older and they have a, a risk for HCC? So it's, it's uh, mentioned in the guidelines for, for Fabienne, even Harry was on the guidelines and Pietro, what was the evidence behind that? Or should we be doing clinical trials with immune tolerant patients with a cancer endpoint, as difficult as it is? So if I can start, um, well, the overall idea of the panel was that uh, there are some situations where antiviral therapy with uh, NA uh, can be or could be or should be used uh, in, in some E antigen positive patients, so called immunotolerant. Um, for example, you know, family history for cancer, family history eventually for cirrhosis, um, other conditions that we mentioned in the guidelines. So uh, we all acknowledge that there are no studies really, as every clearly showed to everybody, suggesting that this should be the case for all patients. Uh, at the same time, so I have to say that in my experience, we don't see so many antigen positive, you know, immunotolerant, of course. But we have a large, you know, Chinese community here in our city and other patients with this profile. And actually, it's quite difficult for us to find not a reason not to start antiviral therapy. Please remember, antiviral therapy is fully reimbursed in our region, in our country, in so and everything is fully reversed. So that's a major advantage. So it's really very difficult to find a reason not to start. Almost impossible to find someone without a family history for cancer. Almost uh, very difficult to find someone very young. They tend to be kind of in the middle 40s, you know, 30, 40. So kind of, you know, fibrous kind is not perfect. So actually in our practice, which is different from standard uh, Hong Kong situation, probably most of the patients already start on therapy. Of course, it's challenging, compliance is limited. You know, we are looking for long-term studies. And of course, we are including these patients into the new clinical trials with new drugs. Hey, can I ask one last follow-up question, Scott, before we close to uh, yes, Kunem? So yes, obviously the IT patients, how, how does the FDA look upon IT patients to be enrolled in studies with new treatment because we don't have an official uh, treatment criteria in their guidelines yet uh, but they are enrolled in in studies with novel therapy so what are your thoughts on that uh, Punen? okay so you know i agree with uh, jordan what he was saying initially about you know um, risk associated with new therapies and it brings us back to these immunotolerant patients where guidelines really are not recommending treatment. And if you're trying to give newer agents to these patients, we have to be very careful that the benefit outweighs the risk, you know, and there should be a good prospect for benefit in terms of surface antigen loss or some other, you know, like we were talking about decrease in HCC, which will take a very long time to, you know, to really uh, look at that endpoint. So we have to balance any potential risk with the benefit these patients will be getting. We have heard from patient communities that patients, you know, would like to have a surface antigen loss endpoint because, you know, the stigma associated with being surface antigen positive is a big one. 
So we had to factor in all that. And that's why, as I was, as I mentioned during my talk, that we have to talk to patient communities. We have to, you know, gain their perspective, how much risk they're willing to take and what benefits are they looking for these um, therapies, and especially with populations who are really not recommended for treatment at this mm -hmm. point of time. Very much for that answer, Puneet. And so, with that, I think we're at twelve fifteen. I'd like to hand back over to uh, Adam for concluding remarks uh, for the first uh, part of our HPV Cure workshop. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you, Scott. Um, and uh, I want to thank all of the faculty today. I mean, it was outstanding uh, talks. I mean, really engaging topics that are very current and timely for hepatitis B cure overall. And kind of give us something to look forward to when we uh, go into ASLD over the next few days to see um, see updates on these specific topics. And uh, so, just a few things to uh, close out for our session today is that you know those of you who are interested in a certificate of attendance, uh, the meeting survey uh, will be sent to you by email. And after you complete the survey, you can have a certificate of attendance will be provided. And then. Uh, the um, the lectures from today's uh, from today's sessions will all recorded and will be available on air by events air uh, on the virtual portal soon. Please log in with your registered email address and your personal pin code, and you can go back and view any of these presentations. So then, uh, again, we certainly couldn't do this without the support and sponsorship that we've had over the years for the HPV Cure Workshop. So I want to thank again the, the sponsors listed here on the slides for their continued support. And uh, finally, we certainly want to advertise for the next session, which will be Wednesday, December 2nd, the same time, 10 to 1220 Eastern Time in the US. And this session will be uh, really a, a, a summary of all of these topics that we're talking about, these different antiviral treatments. So an update from the ASLD meeting on the new antiviral therapies for hepatitis B. So we certainly hope you will tune back in here in a few weeks and, uh, and take in the second session for the HPV Cure Workshop. So with that, uh, again, I want to thank everybody for attending today virtually. I want to thank the faculty and the speakers for putting the time into excellent presentations. And uh, it was a fantastic presentation so or, or session. So thank you, everybody, and, and have a great day.